So, infrastructure as code. I actually told you I was going to talk about this, if you've been paying attention in the first talk. So, I was born in the Iron Age, when in order to get a new server, you had to talk to some kind of operations people that have to go out and buy a physical machine, install it, plug it in, configure the whole thing. It could take weeks, if you were lucky, maybe months. But now we live in the cloud age. You want a new server? You go to AWS or whatever your source is, type a few lines, click it to click on some UI, boom, you've got servers popping up and down like crazy. The question is though, how do we manage this? How do we make sure we can take full advantage of the cloud age? Because the problem is our thinking about how we manage infrastructure is Iron Age thinking. Naturally, because that's what we've known for most of our time. It's only in the last decade or so that the leading organizations have begun to enter the cloud age. And we've got very little knowledge to base this on. And infrastructure as code is really a way of managing the cloud age. In fact, I would argue, as many of my colleagues do, that if, you don't, if you're not using infrastructure as code, you are not going to reap the benefits of cloud. It's cloud you might as well not bother almost. Infrastructure code is that important. If you think, I was at a little conference in uh, San Francisco earlier this year where it was all about microservices. And I, uh, so I took the important point of keep saying, well, this is more important than microservices. So I'd say, you know, um, getting a continuous delivery system set up, that's more important than microservices. Don't even think about microservices until you've got that going. And I was like, infrastructure as code is more important than microservices. I had about half a dozen of them by the end. I probably made myself very unpopular with the organizers. <laughs> so what is infrastructure as code? Well, I'm going to go through again and help define what it's about in terms of a number of principles. Um, and these principles, you'll see the reference at the end, is based on a, a, a forthcoming book. So the first thing, and really the key thing about it, is we define our infrastructure through files, some kind of definitional system. Typically text files, right? And here you're thinking about things like Puppet or Ansible or things of this kind. And we use these as executable code to create our infrastructure. And this really is the essence of what infrastructure's code is about. And the name is very well phrased. We're basically treating our definition of our infrastructure the same way we treat programming code. One of the main reasons that we're trying to do this is we're trying to get rid of the evil snowflake servers. You know the Snowflake servers, those beautifully tended machines that no one dare touch. If you're out there and you say, well, you know, we really ought to upgrade to you know, Rails 1.9, but I, we didn't touch the server. <laughs> you know, it's Java 6, well, maybe, but you know, it would mean touching that server. <laughs> That's when you've got a Snowflake server. Beautifully crafted, all sorts of things have been done to it over the years. You have no idea. If you touch it and something breaks, you have no idea how to put it back together again. Infrastructure as code gives you a statement of what that infrastructure should look like and allows you to get to a much better kind of server, which I call the Phoenix server. The Phoenix server means that at any time you can surf safely burn down your server and be confident that you can recreate it. Now, there are two typical ways to get to a Phoenix server. The first is a approach called configuration synchronization. With configuration synchronization, you start by creating a new server, and then you look at the code and you say, well, I need to make a change here, so I now adjust the code. You know, adding a new service that needs to be present, for instance, in your puppet file or whatever it is. And then you do a synchronization step that synchronizes the server back to the code. And a lot of the tools that talk about infrastructure of code are, are think of themselves in this kind of way. You have your code, you make modifications, and then you resync the configuration. This is a big step forwards, um, and you know, this is a great technique. But it has some disadvantages. The main disadvantage is you can never be sure you've completely got everything. It's very easy for something to change in a server that's not covered by the configuration. And if that happens, you get this configuration drift where what's on the server and what's in your um, code file are subtly different. Now, a good way to do this, to, to fix this, is to actually get into the habit of burning down your servers. 
And in fact, if you do that all the time, you come to a different, you come to the other technique, which is the immutable server. With the immutable server, any time you change your configuration, you burn your server down and you build a new one. And that would be stupid to do in the Iron Age, but in the Cloud Age, it's actually very straightforward. And the nice thing about immutable servers is that it eliminates configuration drift. There's no way your server is going to be out of sync with your configuration for any significant length of time because you're burning down and recreating servers so frequently. It also means you're more confident that you have a true Phoenix because the more often you burn it down and recreate it, the more confident you are that you can do it. It's one of these things that you, know, you need to do regularly. But whichever of those techniques you use, the crucial thing is no logging into the server to change things. That's right out. If you want to make a change to the server, you alter the configuration file and you either reapply or you rebuild a new server. And basically, you can basically turn off any ability to get in and make changes directly through logging in. That's a big shift for people we've found um, time and time again. That's a big shift for, for people to get used to, the fact that they don't change by logging in. Actually, you are allowed to do it to experiment with things, to experiment to figure out what's going on, as long as you then throw it away and put it in the configuration file. So no logging in whatsoever, right? What we're after is the Phoenix server. Why are we after it? What the benefit? The great benefit here is I can now confidently create and destroy servers, which is, of course, the whole point of using the cloud. What's the point of this elastic, you know, users when you need, as much as you need, if you can't actually, if, you know, if you're creating a cloud thing and you're putting a server on there and, you, and you're not going to ever bring it down for weeks or months, what's the point of using the cloud in the first place? The strength of the cloud is I can use um, and create and destroy servers. This gives me that. So a lot of comments that people say, well, what about documentation? How do you document your infrastructure if you're doing something like this? And here the thing to think about is, well, what often happens with documentation is the documentation is read by a human being, and then the human being sets up the infrastructure. I mean, where in a lot of processes, this is the way things go. Infrastructure as code changes this. It says you've got the code becomes the documentation of your system. Now, of course, this is all the caveats as ever with code as documentation. You've got to make the effort to make it clear. You've got to think about how it communicates effectively, and it's not going to be everything. You know, there's a lot of stuff that can't be expressed as in the code. But that's the thing that you're targeting, to try and do that. And it has some important consequences. If you hand a bunch of instructions to a human being and say, go and configure me a whole bunch of servers, sometimes there's going to be differences. Particularly if there's more than one human in the mix who will interpret the instructions slightly differently. On the other hand, with infrastructure as code, computers, they're really good at doing the same thing repetitively all the time and getting the same result. So with infrastructure as code, you get better consistency. And of course, very obviously, you also get better scale. It's really boring to go off and manually configure a thousand servers. But yeah, computers aren't bored. They could listen to me all day, and they wouldn't fall asleep. <laughs> so if we want scale, where is this really important? Microservices. If you're going to be configuring servers for hundreds of services in a mature microservices setup, you'd better be doing this. So as I said, don't even consider microservices if you're not prepared to consider infrastructure as code. You can't be serious about it without it. The next one will look familiar from the previous talk. Version. Everything. Everything that describes your configuration should go into those files and the whole thing kept under version control. Um, the main benefit that's often said, you know, compliance and audit. Anybody wants to know what your system looked like six months ago? You can very accurately tell them because it's all under version control. That's the main reason that people get excited about this. But of course, all the things that I talked about event sourcing suddenly become true here as well. There's lots of other stuff you can do by keeping everything in your version control systems. And you don't need to buy any fancy software for this. This is just regular version control stuff. Lots of people, they store their stuff in Git, or the, you know, the equivalent. Um, it's very much commodity tools. 
The other thing you do, constantly be pro testing what you're doing. Hammer on what you're doing. Always be testing what's going on. And what this implies is, again, you know, something that comes from treating infrastructure as code. If you're building an application in a modern way, what are you going to do? You're going to set up a deployment pipeline for that application. So a deployment pipeline is a very straightforward idea. Hopefully most of you are familiar with it. You've got some software system, a programmer that's looking after the software system, and the programmer wants to make a change. She makes the change and comes up with a new software system. We then put it through a pipeline of checks. First check is typically we'll build the software, make sure it actually compiles and, and hooks together. And then we subjugate it to tests. Early stage unit tests, which are fast, testing micro levels. And then we broaden the range and the, the um, time cost of doing so in a pipeline of steps. Each step is a deployment into an environment. And then we finish with a final deployment, which is a live environment, and it goes to the users. That's the basic idea of a deployment pipeline. If you're building applications today, this is the essence of what you should be doing, continuous delivery, and it's a very useful technique. The same can be done for infrastructure, code as infrastructure. You have to think about, okay, what does it mean to test my infrastructure, to create it within test environments to see whether it's working? But it's really the same thing as working with the code. And you can use similar kinds of techniques to be able to do that. So again, we think of our infrastructure definition as code and subject it to the same kind of working practices that we do for application development. Another crucial thing, we make lots of little changes, not few big changes. And this again, common theme that will be familiar to people who have heard me talk about this kind of stuff before. It all becomes causes because of the consequences of, ch of big changes versus little changes. With many things in life, we find that we have a situation where, which could be expressed in terms of this pseudograph. That the pain compared to the time between actions is an exponential curve. If, I'm, if we're talking about integrating software, if I integrate software once every year, it's going to be a really horrible, painful process. If I'm integrating software every day, nothing happens. We don't really notice. In that situation, we have this very um, counterintuitive notion that how the, by doing something painful, we actually want to do it more frequently to lower the pain. And the same is true of infrastructure changes. You want to make lots of little changes. If anything goes wrong, then you can find out. So what it all boils down to is that with that execution, with the small changes, each change carries a lot less risk for your infrastructure. Same is true, of course, for application code, particularly true here with infrastructure. Now, a little sidebar from this, that is a consequence, is also something to think about, is this phrase from John Allsport that the mean time to recovery is actually more important than your time between failures. It's actually more important, most of the time, to, rather than to prevent failures from occurring, is to make sure you can recover really quickly when a failure happens. Because the reality is, it's very hard to prevent many kinds of failure. But if you can come up with a, a solid recovery mechanism, and a good detection mechanism, so you can detect something going wrong and recover fast, then even if you can't predict the failure, you can still live with it. And because failures in complex systems are hard to predict, this really becomes quite vital. And what this means, of course, you need good monitoring. And again, with infrastructure as code, if anything goes wrong in your infrastructure, you can always revert back to the previous version. But if you keep your changes small, you can probably spot what went wrong easily because you've only got a localized change. Again, if your programmers have been doing things like continuous integration, this kind of logic should seem fairly obvious because it's what we do with our code. And then the sixth principle is we keep what's going up all the time. We don't have downtimes. We don't have maintenance windows. We keep 24-hour operation, which a lot of people need anyway. So we use techniques like blue-green deployment that allow us to be able to build a new version of a system in a parallel environment and then quickly switch over to it um, in order to run. Again, this is very similar to what we do for applications. 
where we're able to use the same techniques um, for our infrastructure definition. So these are the six practices. Um, as I said, these I'm just pinched these from a colleague whose book I'll push up there in a moment. I'm just giving you time for you for the photographers up there to uh, get it. You know, the iPad's raised. That's what happens these days. Um, and the benefits that I listed out. Um, an important set of things. For more information on this, um, the real key thing to look at is the forthcoming book by my colleague Keith Morris, who's based in London, who's really been trying to capture what we and what other organizations that have been working with these techniques have discovered over the last few years of operating in this style. Um, I think infrastructure as code is a really important shift for our industry. It's what really is the payoff for cloud. Um, and so if you're at all interested in taking advantage of what cloud gives us, and I think it's a very compelling um, set of advantages, then this is what you need to get into. And if you're not getting into cloud, I still think you should get into infrastructure as code because the advantages that I talked about are still applicable, even in a traditional iron setup. They're not as important. They aren't as revolutionary as they are in, in terms of the synergy with cloud, but they're still important. Um, and certainly, um, I would start right now with saying, how much of this can you do in your environment? And that's my third and final talk, and I hope you enjoyed them.